ladder of ours, these planes can drop an atom bomb any place on Earth. America has never fired the first shot in any war from the revolution in 1776 until the present, nor has she ever failed in a fight for freedom on land or on sea. In all her wars, America has retaliated swiftly with the early wars featuring man-to-man -man combat. In World War I, man-to-man -man combat again prevailed, but aerial warfare, a new combat technique was born. In World War II, aerial retaliation came into its own. But retaliation in any future war, waged with supersonic aircraft and nuclear weapons, must be accomplished even more swiftly with new techniques as explained by General O.P. Wyland, Commanding General of the Tactical Air Command. The defense of America is no longer limited to narrowly defined areas. Any area of the world could become a battleground for our security. In recognition of this, the Tactical Air Command's combat and airlift units are prepared to meet aggression and threats to our security in even the farthest reaches of the globe. Toward this end, TAC has developed the Tactical Air Strike Force concept. This concept is designed to make possible the rapid deployment of selected elements of tactical air as a self-sustaining task force anywhere in the world to act swiftly and decisively against aggression. In-flight refueling permits our tactical fighters and bombers to cross the widest oceans so that no area of the world by distance alone is closed to air strike forces. Nuclear weapons provide them tremendous firepower. The size of these strike forces is dependent only on the magnitude of the situation, whether a major war or a brush fire conflict. In September 1956, TAC conducted the first full-scale exercise of the air strike force concept with an operation having the code name of Mobile Baker. Under the 19th Air Force as the operational command, we assembled supersonic fighters, fighter bombers, tactical bombers, reconnaissance fighters, aerial tankers, and troop carrier transports, and launched them on a mission to Europe as an airstrike force. The mission was highly successful and provided convincing evidence of tax readiness to meet aggression anywhere, anytime, with decisive results. This is the story of a practice airstrike force codenamed Operation Mobile Baker. It could have been the real thing. Mobile Baker was formed and executed by the 19th Air Force at Foster Air Force Base, Texas. The order for deployment was received by General Henry Vasilio at his headquarters. TAC units for a long time trained and prepared for instant action and rapid movement to any area of the world were alerted. 40 tactical aircraft, the orders said. A small force, actually, but composed of some of the best fighting jet planes in the world, capable of waging war on any scale, including atomic. The group was led by 16 F-100C Super Sabres, built by North American Aviation, the Air Force's first supersonic fighter, now adapted for ocean-spanning missions. 16 Republic Aircraft F-84F Thunderstreak fighter bombers, equally at home fighting air-to-air -air or on ground strafing or bombing missions. Four RF-84F photo reconnaissance planes, a long-nosed thunderstreak. It performs at high and low altitudes, capable of 24-hour camera duty. Four Douglas B-66 tactical bombers, twin jet near supersonic additions to TAC, built to carry nuclear weapons far, fast, and in any kind of weather plus necessary support aircraft, like the huge Douglas C-124 Globemasters, backbone of TAC's heavy airlift fleet. And of course, the tankers, the KB-29, a Boeing plane using the flying boom system of refueling. And the Boeing KB-50s to refuel the F-100s using the newer probe and drogue system, 
capable of refueling the B-66s or three Super Sabres at one time. Transports moved into combat bases to load support elements and equipment, fuel, armament, and spare parts. 3,000 miles over water is no trip for the unprepared. Then the briefing before takeoff. These technicians, experts all, turn stockpiles of material into efficient away from home bases. The trip was a long and tedious one for the crews and technicians with various stops en route. Later, the fighters traveled as many miles nonstop in a matter of hours. First, the technical units were deployed. Support aircraft went to Newfoundland and to North Africa. Tankers to a Middle Atlantic refueling base. Then came the message. Takeoff schedule 0600 tomorrow. A rapid series of final briefings. In the early dawn, just before takeoff, tension mounts. Fighters jumped off from Foster, landed at Newfoundland, refueled, and took off again for a mid-Atlantic aerial refueling point. They used Navy radar ships and C-54 radar contact planes for checkpoints. Then on to North Africa. Landed and refueled again, they jumped off for final Italy and Germany destinations. Tankers at the island refueling base had been prepared for their role as aerial service stations. When the fighter elements started, the tankers were ready. Back at Newfoundland, half an ocean away, the Super Sabres took off. As soon as they were airborne, word was flashed to the Mid-Atlantic base where it was relayed to the tankers. Heavily loaded with fuel as they were, for the tankers to climb to altitude and orbit at rendezvous, it was necessary to take off at almost the same time as the jets, 1,500 miles away. High above the Atlantic, the fighter pilot's world consists of his cockpit, surrounded by only two elements, sky and water, as far as all horizons. Of course, there's always enough fuel to make land safely, but miss that refueling rendezvous, and though you may be safe, you're out of the mission. At altitude, the tankers begin a long, slow circle, waiting for their customers. Scanner, we should be getting a call from the jets any minute. Unreal the droves. Bravo, this is Camp Hobo 1, reading you 5 by 5. Read me. 
Powers Bravo 1, read you loud and clear. Request the steer, over. Powers 1 from Hobo 1, stand by. Sparks, you all set up back there? Powers 1 from Hobo 1, go ahead with the transmission. Roger, this is Powers Bravo 1, transmitting. Powers Bravo, your steer to Camp Hobo is 129 degrees. Repeat, 129 degrees. Over. Roger, Camp Hobo, steering 129 degrees. Estimate approximately 150 miles from rendezvous. What is your status? Over. Powers 1 from Hobo 1. The weather here is clear with scattered clouds. We have four tankers plus two spares ready for you. Drogues are out and wet. Our altitude is 14,000. Angels 14. Over. Thank you, Hobo. We're starting our letdown. Powers Magpie 2, I have a tally ho, 1130, level, way out. Scanner to pilot, I have the chicks in view. Powers lead to individual flights. Switch to refueling frequency and proceed to your tanker. from Magpie 3. We're all set for a hookup. Roger, Magpie. Camp Hobo 3 ready. Drogues are wet. Magpie, you have good contact and are taking fuel. Turbulence gave you a little trouble that time. Try again. I should have put some glue on it. Good contact, Magpie. Pull in the slack. Trying, Magpie. Back off until I free the take up. The flying boom system of refueling one plane at a time is used on the F-84s. This system requires excellent technique on the part of the boom operator, who, occupying the tail gunner's compartment of the KB-29, must match his control of the flying boom with the movements of the fighter. The fighter pilot must, in turn, slow his faster aircraft down to tanker speed, and then, after making contact with the boom, maintain his position. Fours line up for service. As one is filled, it drops down and away, and the next one in line moves into position. In either the flying boom or the probe and drogue system, as each plane is loaded and moves out, the pilots wait until all planes in the flight are full before heading for the next stop. Our indications show you're fully serviced. No fuel is flowing. Roger. I'll hang on a minute and we'll disconnect together. Magpie 2 here. My tank lights are on. Magpie 2 from Magpie lead. Start backing off now. Don't forget, we give green stamps. Okay, Hobo. Keep them for us until we get back.
fire lead from three and four. We're ready for join up. Magpie lead here. Let's reach for altitude. Ready for AB. Now. In a matter of minutes, the planes are refueled and headed for North Africa. In a record four hours and 55 minutes after leaving Newfoundland, they will be landing. An average of 578 miles per hour for the 2,800 mile trip, almost 10 miles per minute. If the pilots expected to see burnoosed Arabs or camel teams, they were disappointed. This is an American base, and American bases look much the same wherever they are. Anyway, this was no sightseeing trip. On the ground, no time was wasted. While the jets were refueling again, pilots quickly shed their cumbersome survival suits worn on overwater flights. Then it was off to Strike Force Mobile Headquarters, no more than two and one half hours across the Alps. The F 84s to Italy, the F 100 Super Sabres to Germany. There the practice mission ended. But if this had been the real thing, technicians and armorers at both bases would have rushed into action. Planes, once loaded, would take off to deliver a devastating tactical blow to the enemy homeland. The retaliatory power of attack nuclear airstrike force is tremendous. More powerful than a World War II air armada composed of thousands of airplanes. Airstrike forces like Mobile Baker stand ready for instant deployment whenever and wherever needed to halt, prevent, or destroy aggression. These planes can drop an atom bomb any place on Earth.